everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 Webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I will be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our terribly long series about the living world. Topic for the day is going to be innate immunity, and where we've been speeding through huge body systems last couple videos, this one we're going to start to slow down and focus in on the immune system for a couple videos. So hopefully this will be a little more digestible than the last. As always, here's your objectives. These are, these are the things that I need you to know or be able to do by the end of this video. First one, recognize the difference between innate and adaptive immunity. And second, compare and contrast innate immune strategies found in vertebrates. So let's go ahead and jump on in. First, we want to talk about innate versus adaptive immunity. Now, we're going to go through adaptive immunity in depth later on in other videos. Just know that it is immunity that recognizes the invader and builds up a memory over time. This is kind of the idea that if you've had smallpox once as a kid, you probably won't get it later on because your immune system is adapted to it. Innate immunity is kind of like a first line of defense. It doesn't have a memory. It doesn't really recognize, hey, I've seen you before. It is like a blunt instrument that just goes out and takes care of anything that is invading your body. So next up, we're going to go ahead and jot through a bunch of different types of innate uh, defense, and then we'll be done for the day. Now, the first kind of line of defense is a barrier defense. Barrier defense is anything that keeps the pathogen from getting to your body in the first place. So obviously, the skin is the best known type of barrier defense. It keeps things from getting into the body. Um, you could also include things like mucus. Um, you could include the cilia in our like respiratory tract that sweeps mucus and stuff back up so it can cough it out. All that stuff that keeps things from getting in in the first place is a type of barrier defense. Now, the next set is going to be cellular innate defenses. And these are our internal army. This is a bunch of organisms that don't really, not organisms, cells, that don't really have like special recognition software for like influenza or hepatitis or the cold or whatever. These are just general, like I am going to go out and take out anything that is not part of this body. So they're not really intelligent. They are more like big dumb animals, but those big dumb animals keep our body free of a lot of problems. So let's go ahead and talk through their roster. I'm just going to kind of pump through them one at a time. So first up is a toll-like receptor. Forgive the fuzzy image there. My apology. Um, these guys bind to molecules characteristics of pathogens, and there could be several things that this includes. It could include double-stranded RNA that's found in some viruses. It could include receptor cells that are found on the surface of uh, bacteria. Anything that is like kind of molecular level stuff, um, a toll-like receptor is going to bind to that and then usually disrupt some process. So it could bind to the RNA, preventing it from being transcribed later on. It could per, um, bind to like a cell surface receptor, preventing that one cell from binding to anything else and infecting it. So this guy works at the molecular level. He usually tries to stop some sort of binding or recognition. Then we've got the neutrophils. These are killers that circulate in the blood and they engulf pathogens. So they are able to do phagocytosis, which means that they can take their membranes, surround a pathogen, and then take that pathogen into a vacuole where it will be killed using usually some sort of lysosome activity, probably lysozyme, that's going to break down that thing once it has been engulfed by a neutrophil. But recognize that these guys circulate in the blood. And then we've got their friends, the macrophages. Uh, macrophages don't circulate in the blood. They generally stay put. They uh, generally reside in tissues and organs. They are larger than a neutrophil, but they essentially have the same action where they recognize that something, they recognize something that is not part of the body, engulf it, and then once that thing has been engulfed into a vacuole and isolated, it will be acted on by a lysosome to be digested. We've got dendritic cells, which live in the skin, and they stimulate adaptive immunity. So in our uh, later videos where we talk about the immune system that can recognize uh, the invader, these guys stimulate that system. They also work to engulf other cells in a phagocytic manner. And eosinophils. These guys defend against multicellular invaders, so they don't really move around a whole lot, they don't circulate, and they don't really carry out phagocytosis, but 
if you've got something like plasmodium or you know another multicellular invader in your body this is going to kill them off and now that i've said plasmodium is multicellular i don't know that that is quite correct but recognize the neosinophil is defending against multicellular invaders and finally you've got the natural killer cells and these guys actually work on infected cells so where all of the ones that i've just talked about work on a pathogen that's gotten into your body whether it be bacteria or a virus this works on your cells that have been infected so let's say a virus has infected one of your cells a natural killer cell is going to kill off the infected cell such that it does not reproduce and make more of that virus same for if like a bacteria has infected one of your cells or something like that now when we get sick flu cold things like that a lot of the symptoms that we have are actually a result of these natural killer cells killing off our own body cells it's not necessarily the virus reproducing that makes us feel crappy it is these cells taking care of the infection we also have antimicrobial peptides and what this is is it's a system of interferons and complement <laughs> interferons and the complement system and it disrupts the action of many pathogens now i'm not going to get real specific on these but basically what they do is kind of like the toll-like receptors at a um, molecular level dna rna level these guys recognize things that are not part of our body so let's say that there's a bacteria that secretes some sort of protein these would recognize that as not being one of our proteins and disrupt it or let's say that a virus gets into a cell and makes itself start producing a certain type of rna these would recognize that that type of rna bind to that cell and disrupt whatever that cell is going to do so this is another set of molecules that work at the molecular level to interfere with some sort of system that is helping that uh, pathogen propagate itself last one i uh, kind of worked through all those pretty quick last thing i want to talk about is the inflammatory response now this is another one of like those first line of defense things and there's a cascade of steps that happen that i want to walk you through real quick so first one starts out here number one the classic example sorry let me get a different color pen um classic example is a splinter puncturing the skin so splinter punctures the skin very first thing that happens is histamine is released now you need to know histamine because it is responsible for setting off our entire inflammatory response so everything that's going to happen as a result of this puncture starts with this signaling of histamine now once that histamine has been released it does several things first thing it does is right here it causes capillaries to leak releasing the phagocytes and clotting factors into the wound so we want phagocytes because they're going to come in and they're going to eat any bacteria phagocytes would be things like those macrophages that we just talked about um, it could also include the oh not the eosinophils the ones that are currently escaping my mind right now but remember that macrophages are one of them that is going to come in and it's going to engulf any invading cells um, it's also going to uh, release clotting factors so this could be things that cause the blood to clot up um, it's also going to cause capillaries and blood vessels to dilate releasing more blood to the site um, you are also those phagocytes that have been released are going to engulf bacteria dead cells and cellular debris so the reason they are there is to kind of clean up the mess they are the cleanup crew and they want to take care of any pathogens before those pathogens can spread any further you also have platelets being signaled to move out of the capillaries to seal up the wounded area this would be the formation of a scab or blood clotting or anything like that and um, as those di uh, capillaries and blood vessels in the area dilate they're going to release fluid into the area which is going to cause swelling and the increased blood flow is what causes the redness associated with uh, the inflammatory response so all of this is started by histamine that is released upon the injury and then from there you got a cascade of things coming in to kind of clean up the mess and prevent further damage so i know that was a lot of like random stuff that i just kind of worked through real quick hopefully you can go back and rewind it and check it out as needed thank you for spending some time with us talking about the innate immune response um we will have later videos on the immune response soon this has been the lab 207 webcast my name is mr kite and we'll see you again